I don't think a blackout period is necessary. It's actually harmful in, in many cases because it's going to extend the stems and give less time for the plant to uh, absorb light, which is where it's getting its energy and nutrients from. But because basil and arugula, their stems don't really extend at all. They can stay very, very short, almost to a point where it's very difficult to harvest them. So I, I generally recommend uh, with basil and arugula to not stack them if you have the space. I know. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. My name is Jonah, and I founded one of Canada's largest microgreens farms, growing over 250,000 microgreen trays in my farming career. And I'm on a mission to help growers and farmers grow more food with less resources and make their farms lean profit machines. On today's AMA, we're going to touch on insurance for microgreens businesses, what to include on your website and brochures to maximize sales and customer retention, grants for microgreens, and so much more. Let's get right into it. The first question we have is, I've grown several trays of buckwheat and it grows really well. Do you think there's a market for this microgreen and have you ever tried it? So yeah, I've definitely tried growing buckwheat. Um, I actually sold it for maybe about a couple years uh, back when I started my microgreens farm in 2013. And uh, back then there was definitely a uh, decent demand for the product. It was kind of a pain because the hulls are even more of a challenge to get off than for sunflower microgreens because uh, they're smaller and they yeah just don't really tend to come off very easily. Um, but forget about the growing issues, just in terms of demand, I've seen a shift in what products are more popular as time has gone on. So when I started, uh, Sunflower um, was one of the most popular microgreens uh, instead of now, which is more broccoli. Uh, wheatgrass was really popular. Buckwheat was quite popular. And now it's shifted more towards like the broccolis, uh, basil, cilantro, those type of crops, amaranths. Uh, and then now I see more of a shift uh, in increasing demand for edible flowers. So there's there's always like a moving tide in what's popular. Um, for example, at farmers markets, just not microgreens in particular, but just general uh, salad greens. Kale, when I started my farm in 2013, was the most popular salad green or edible green uh, at, at farmer's markets. Like you had kale, it would sell out immediately. If you go to a farmer's market now, people don't sell out a kale. It's not the most popular green. It had its like hype phase and then kind of dwindled down. So this kind of happens within the microcosm of microgreens. So microgreens as a whole, the demand has been growing quite steadily and uh, uh, maybe even exponentially in certain time periods. Um, so that's great. That's like the industry as a whole is growing. But within the industry, you're going to have ups and downs, ebbs and flows, of what pop, uh, what products are popular. So, um, buckwheat right now is just not a popular microgreen. Um, while you may be able to find some specific demand for it from, uh, someone that used to eat it a few years ago or someone that's never tried and wants to try it, you're not going to find it's going to be popular like broccoli or, uh, kale microgreens or, um, you know, uh, making like a seasonal mix or something like that. So I personally don't think it's worth it to grow. Uh, to sell. If you want to grow to consume, that's totally cool. Uh, but to sell, it's just not going to be popular. It's like wheatgrass. It's kind of just gone a bit out of style, even though wheatgrass is still a really healthy product to consume uh, as, as a juice. It's just not as popular as it once was. So, um, you know, all sorts of other green powders and uh, other health supplements have kind of taken over that niche that it had. Uh, and buckwheat never really had that like specific health niche, but it was more like a a relatively easy to grow high yielding microgreen, uh, but it just never really caught on. So I, in my personal opinion, I would suggest maybe just trying another crop or if you want to grow it for personal use, that's the best way to do it. Next question is what advice would you give a new microgreen business owner in regards to finding a suitable insurance provider? Uh, so this is a good question. Uh, some people uh, may not know that like in most places you don't have to have uh, insurance for your business. So, uh, you know, when you have a car, most places, at least in North America, and I'm sure most places in the world, you have to have automobile, automobile insurance to be able to drive uh, a car, uh, because there's a risk that you're going to injure someone else 
driving it. So they just made it a law that you have to have insurance. Whereas for business, you don't have to have insurance. It's a choice. So just like your house, if you have a, if you have a house, uh, you don't have to get homeowners insurance. You can if you want. And generally it makes sense because it's a big investment. So there's a risk. Um, so the, the main business insurance you want for a migraines business that is important to get, I think, is liability insurance. So the risk uh, is, is, is very small. It's a small chance, percentage chance, that someone will sue you because they get sick from your product. But it's not worth the risk for the cost. Like if you do a cost benefit analysis, um, like it's just not worth the risk. So for a few hundred dollars a year, especially when you're smaller, the cost of insurance is generally lower. And then as you sell more and more product, the risk becomes larger because there's more product out there. So um, they usually insurance providers usually charge more. So it generally wouldn't be that expensive to get liability insurance when starting out. Um, so that's the only insurance that you really have to have. Uh, there's all sorts of other types of business insurance, like business interruption insurance, which maybe would have been helpful for for businesses during COVID that they had to shut down because they were selling to restaurants um, or, you know, you know, God forbid there's like a fire or something, uh, you know, that you can't operate your, your business or you don't have power, let's say, for uh, a week because there's a big storm. There's insurance for these type of things um, as well. I generally uh, like th those are more optional. Like if you think it's worth it, it makes sense to get those. But the liability insurance is the is the one that's the most important. Um, now, keep in mind the odds of actually, first of all, got, like there's so few people uh, that I know that have ever had uh, at, at, like any sort of getting people sick from migraines, and usually they're really large scale farms when uh, where where there's like a lot of staff and the staff aren't trained well on on handling things. Um, and, and having basic food safety training. So it's, I've never heard of a small farm, like a, a farm from their house or a very small farm that just isn't a small commercial facility actually have an outbreak on migraines. So the odds are very slim. Um, and then even if in theory, uh, you know, obviously you don't, you don't want anyone to get sick for your product, but if, if in theory someone did get sick from your product, they would have to prove that it's coming from your product to be able to do a lawsuit because you're like you're innocent until proven guilty. So unless they can prove, like they take the clamshell and send it to a lab and see that it got you sick, uh, that there was something in there that could have got you sick, then there's no proof that uh, you know that they got sick from your product. It could be from a restaurant they went to or uh, something else they bought at a grocery store. So that's to be proof. Um, so that's the thing that makes it obviously quite challenging um, for a lawsuit to come into place with with this. But having said that, like I said, it's I personally don't think it's worth the risk. And just to make it easy, like for honest, honestly, just to sleep more at peace at night, knowing that you're not putting uh, your assets at risk. If something did happen, uh, I think it's worth spending, you know, whatever, 200 to a thousand dollars, depending on your size, uh, roughly is what something like that would cost uh, a year. So, um, you know, and generally it would be on the lower end for a lot of growers that are uh, not outputting much product. <coughs> So yeah, so that's generally what I recommend for insurance. Do you stack trays during germination? Yes, uh, definitely stack trays during germination. Uh, you'll get much better results that way. I remember many, many years ago, um, I don't know why, but like I went against the tide. So everyone online, you know, maybe in 2014, 2015 was like, stack your trays, stack your trays. And I remember I only stacked pea and sunflower and I didn't stack like kale and broccoli. Um, and then there was one day I was just like, you know what, I'm going to test it. And I found that I could use less seed and get the same germination rate because less of the plants or seeds were dying because they were able to extend the roots downward before they got uh, light. Um, and pretty much what was happening before when they weren't stacked is some of the roots would go kind of sideways instead of down because they didn't have that pressure pushing them downwards. And then they'd be going sideways and then you put them under lights and then those uh seeds would die because they don't have they're not getting water because the roots aren't in the soil so uh almost every crop i recommend to stack um basil is the only one i don't recommend stacking it just decreases uh the yield um i find on it so yeah like like i find there's more uneven growth with basil when you stack it uh so generally i find that's not great to stack arugula is another one i probably wouldn't stack because you want it to Arugula and basil are two very unique crops in that um, they actually benefit from having a short blackout period, whereas every other crop 
I don't think a blackout period is necessary. It's actually harmful in, in many cases because it's going to extend the stems and give less time for the plant to uh, absorb light, which is where it's getting its energy and nutrients from. But because basil and arugula, their stems don't really extend at all. They can stay very, very short, almost to the point where it's very difficult to harvest them. So I, I generally recommend uh, with basil and arugula to not stack them if you have the space. I know sometimes space can be a limitation. Um, so they will grow if you stack them. You're just going to have more uneven growth and generally lower yields with those two crops when you stack them. But every other crop I've grown, all the whatever, hundreds of microgreens varieties, um, they all benefit from being stacked. If when creating a brochure or informational web page for microgreens, what information do you feel would be best to spread the word and educate people about microgreens? So a, a website or a brochure is really just a way to uh, convey your message. Um, so you want to obviously first attract people to your website or your brochure. So uh, like usually a brochure is something you do uh, in person. So it would be something that like if you're at a booth at a farmer's market or um, you're trying to give out samples to, to gyms or uh, local fitness centers or something, a brochure would be helpful because then there's, uh, you know, they see the product, the product is what attracts them. And then there's this information that can uh, sell them on why they should buy the product from you. So pretty much what you want to convey is why should they buy the product from you? So um, generally having some sort of, uh, you know, obviously it's a brochure or a website, so you can't write like a autobiography, but just like a short, um, you know, few sentences on why you got into growing microgreens, why you're passionate about it to, you know, help people, uh, you know, gain control of their health and, um, live a more fulfilled life, like wh whatever, whatever is true to you, I think is important that, um, that it, it, it's genuine. Um, and it's not just like something you found, uh, you know, on chat GPT, like, like people can really sense, um, authenticity. So you want it to be what it, what is true to you. Um, so if, you know, you had some sort of health challenge, uh, growing up and, and microgreens helped you on your journey in like trying to, uh, you know, heal whatever disease or whatever, like th those type of things are, are very powerful messages. Um, or you got into it because you really want to love what you do and you love gardening and you love growing food and sharing that experience with people, which is kind of more like where I came from. Um, then you want to convey that. So you, you want to convey your story. Uh, number one, you want to convey why they should be buying microgreens, uh, in general. So you talk about the health benefits, um, you know, that they work with any diet. So, you know, pretty much anyone except for uh, carnivores, which is not very many of us, um, would, 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 would eat microgreens. So if you're a vegan, vegetarian, paleo, uh, keto, uh, pescatarian, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you will be able to add microgreens to your diet. So you're, you, there's a large audience. Um, if you want to like, you know, focus on a niche, like parents that want to feed their kids, you know, healthier snacks or, you know, whatever it may be, like people that are uh, trying to lose weight, like there's different ways to target um, if you want to kind of be more niche. Um, and then having some pictures of your farm or product, or ideally, uh, the best thing would be to have like really high quality images of food with microgreens um, would be great because people see them and they're like, oh, that looks so good. And even if the microgreens aren't necessarily what's making the dish look good, like, or, or what what's making it appetizing, having that color on top of it or as a side salad or, or whatever, um, I think is, is quite powerful because, you know, when you go, for example, to a grocery store and they have a sample, let's say it's like an olive oil sample. Um, and they'll put that olive oil uh, on some, on some like high quality bread with some like really good, uh, pesto or some like bruschetta or something like, but you associate that olive oil with this high quality food. So you want to kind of create that association. Um, so having like, like I said, really uh, high quality images. So Canva is a great place to find images, but um, like ideally, if you can take some yourself, that would be great. Um, and and put that in your brochure and website because then it's food. You're selling food, so you want it to be appetizing to people. So um, there's 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 a lot more of this. I could just probably make an episode just on 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 this, but uh, just to keep it short, like those are some uh, few things that would be quite beneficial to add to your website and or a brochure. Um, to sell and encourage people to buy your microgreens. The next question is, what suggestions do you have for being more efficient when mixing soil and making trays as you grow up to 100 trays per week? Um, so 
at, at 100 trade mark, you're probably not going to buy a soul mixing machine. So that's like my always my number one is like if you're going to afford, if you're at scale to buy a soul mixing machine, you should buy a soul mixing, mixing machine. Uh, it's a tongue twister um, because it's just going to save you so much time. And more importantly, the energy, uh, because it's very labor intensive to mix soil, as a lot of you may know. Um, the first thing I suggest is I'm actually going to be shooting a video um, on using coconut coir versus like a pro mix. Um, and I had to break up like three bricks of the coconut coir and man, it is a slow process. Like anyone that's using coconut coir that's in the compressed bricks, just for that reason alone, it's very inefficient. So if you're using coconut coir on its own and you're buying the bricks and you're decompressing them, that is not a scalable solution in my opinion, because it just takes up way too much time, um, to just mix or, or even just to soak, uh, the, um, the coir to get it to break up and like the process of breaking up by hand is just really, really slow. Whereas the pro mix, uh, HP that's compressed, it breaks up quite easily. Um, and then that leads me to the next thing, which is if you are using uh pro mix HP or any pretty much compressed soil, except for coconut coir, cause it's pretty much a brick, uh, like a, like if it, it's almost like you could throw it on a wall, it wouldn't even break, uh, until, until it's, uh, um, soaked. But for the, for the normal compression, which is just like a one to two or less uh, compression rate, it's going to be soft enough that you can break it up with your hands. So you can use, um, there's a couple of things. There's like uh, a, a cultivator that's just like, like four tines that just spins like this. Um, so it just spins left and right and breaks up the soil. Or an even better idea is um, someone uh, took a, a, a paint mixer so there's like uh, an attachment for a drill that can mix paint if you just attach that to a drill and then just put like a a, a, a bale of soil in a, a bin and just go to town with your with, with your paint mixer it'll break up the soil pretty fast so that's that's a a really good tip for anyone that's that's you know in the early stages um, most people have drills so you just need to get this attachment for uh, uh, mixing paint uh, which will be relatively inexpensive or even just like an auger like an auger attachment for a drill would also work uh to break up the soil so that that would save a ton of time uh that's the first thing um second thing is i would generally break up the soil and mix it in advance of seeding day so uh as you start getting more and more production it makes it a bit easier to split it up over a longer period of time because it doesn't it doesn't feel as much physical labor or as tiring. So if right now you're mixing up your soil, uh, you're filling your flats, you're uh, ideally adding your guy grade fertilizer in there. Um, you are uh, seeding, watering, top coating, uh, stacking, all, like doing all that in one day for let's say 300 trays. It is a lot. It's, 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 it can be like, you, you know, if you, if you don't have automation it could take a long time. Um, so what I'd recommend is trying to split that up a bit more. So if you, if you can do the, so like breaking up the soil, adding the fertilizer, mixing it all in, filling the flats one day, and then the next day doing the seeding, uh, watering and getting them starting to germinate, then it splits it up into two days and makes it a lot easier on your body and, um, and, and makes it much less likely that you're going to burn out because you have, you have to work like eight, 10 hours, you know, prepping trays or, or whatever it is. Um, so I find just splitting it up makes it easier. Um, now, of course, at some point that's not going to work. And that's when, uh, you know, having automation equipment like a soil mixing machine, uh, or some sort of uh, flat filler, uh, the little green seeding machine for seeding, uh, and top coning, like these type of things will definitely, uh, make it a lot faster and more efficient, uh, to, to do the planting process and mixing soil, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that, those are the, the kind of basic tips. Like there's, there's many small things you can do like setting up your space so that you're not you know let's say you're mixing soil in one room and then um you know planting trays in another room like it, it just like you want you want to have it in a linear fashion so uh, as much as you can if you're doing it in your house it could be a little bit uh trickier but if you're in a commercial facility layout can make a big difference because a lot of your time is like movement um, so if you're, if you're moving trays, you want to ideally move them on a rack that's on wheels so you can move a hundred at a time instead of five or six at a time. So there's all sorts of those small tips, um, that can make a big difference, but overall that, that should get you on the right track. So, uh, hope that helps there.
Next question is, do you have any, uh, any other recommendations for soil other than Promix HP? I'm having a hard time seeing the return on my crop paying $110 a bag for Promix. Um, so the first thing uh, that I see from this is $110 a bag from Promix. So uh, most, my guess is you're probably buying Promix on Amazon, which is very, very expensive. So uh, you're paying a lot for shipping. The best bet to get Promix is to go to a local uh, hydroponic store or garden center that would sell the, uh, these type of soils and uh, and purchase it there because there you'll get it for somewhere between 50 and $70, not 110 So right off the bat, you're saving uh, a lot of money there. Um, the alternatives to Promix are using coconut coir or using a coconut coir based soil. Generally speaking, if you're using a coconut coir based soil, that's like a higher quality product. Like I've heard about uh, Coco Loco as an example. Um, those products are going to be much more expensive than Promix because they're not compressed. So you're paying a lot more for the shipping. Plus, generally speaking, coconut coir is generally more expensive. Um, so that's one alternative. Another is to make your own soil mix um, from just you know the raw ingredients. So you take peat moss and uh, vermiculite or perlite uh, and then add in fertilizer and all that kind of stuff um, and, and limestone to, to get the pH rate. But if, if you're new, and, and especially if you don't have a soil mixing machine, that could be a lot more time consuming. Um, it will be less expensive. There's no doubt about it. Um, but you have to so make sure you're sourcing a good quality peat moss because there is a lot of garbage peat moss out there. Um, so Promix does that for you. And I'm not like in love with Promix being like the absolute best product that exists, but it's the most commonly available, uh, easy to use, effective soil uh, that people can get. So that's why I generally recommend it. If you can make your own, you could probably make a better version of Promix that's better suited specific for microgreens than HP. Um, but you're going to be spending a lot of time mixing soil um, and yeah, and then trying to source the ingredients and then storing them as well because um, you need to buy perlite separately and dolomitic limestone and uh, and most likely a wetting agent if you're going to be using uh, peat based soil. So. Um, it's recommended when you're at larger scale to do that when you have a soil mixing machine because it's well, well worth the cost savings. But when you are uh, just growing smaller quantities, it's not worth the cost savings, in my opinion, to start going down that route. Um, so I would wait till you're at a scale or planning to scale up to uh, a commercial facility where you can get a soil mixing machine. And then it makes sense to have your own soil recipe. Next question is, is it safe to eat and sell microgreens that have some mold at the root? So th this is a good question. And uh, it's a little hard for me to answer this because I don't want people to get the impression that like mold is okay. Uh, but from my experience, if there's mold just growing on the soil, it is not uh, a plant pathogen. And there's pretty much, there. there it, just so people know, there is no plant pathogen that is also a human pathogen. Human pathogens come from uh, mostly from other pathogens from animals. So from uh, like cow farms is where you get E. coli and salmonella. Um, uh, generally speaking, like this is not like a cold cut rule, but uh, mo like there, there, as far as I know, there's no plant pathogen that is also a pathogen to humans. Um, so if there is something that's attacking your plant like pythium, it won't make people sick by eating it. Um, if you have pythium uh, in your in your tray. Now, having said that, you want to be selling the highest quality microgreens. So if you have Pythium as an example, and there's rot on your tray, you obviously don't want to be selling that part of the tray. So what I generally do, if that ever happens, is you would push the, the health, a small amount of healthy greens around that down uh, and then just harvest around that. Um, now, if there's mold on the soil and it's not growing up the stems, it's totally fine. That's like as a soil mold, it has nothing to do with affecting the crops. It's natural. Like if you go outside, you may not see it, but when the mushrooms pop up after like, you know, a heavy period of rain for many days, uh, there, there is fungus in the soil. So, and there's fungus on the soil. You just don't always see it. The first thing I would do is if you have mold at the root is to try to eliminate it by uh, increasing airflow or reducing your seeding density. Uh, but having said that in the meantime, you can sell the product. If there's mold growing up the stems, I wouldn't sell that or I would cut it significantly higher than when the, where the mold is. And that's a much bigger issue if you're having mold actually on the stems of the plants. If it's just on the soil, that's a soil mold. But if it starts growing up the stems, 
Um, that's something that's more uh, concerning in the sense of the mold is getting uh, to, to the actual plant material, uh, which is a, a more of a problem. So yeah, so it is safe to eat. Microgreens have mold uh, uh, at the roots. And also keep in mind that a lot of people that are new to microgreens think that brassicas, so like kale, radish, uh, broccoli, they have root hairs that look like mold. They, they look very similar mold, but they're actually just root hairs. So some people confuse that. So if you just Google like uh, uh, radish root hairs versus mold, you'll find tons of pictures on Google. And then that can help assess if it actually is mold, what you're seeing, because uh, it's very it's very possible. It's just actually roots. What temperature is too low for growth? I think my groom was in the 60s uh, Fahrenheit last week. So there is no like hard rule on what temperature is too low to grow. It will depend on the crop, but it will also depend on, um, you know, like what your goals are with the business. So if, if you, what's nice about if it's too cold, it's a lot easier to heat a room than it is to uh, air condition a room because you can literally buy a heater for like $50 on Amazon and then heat your room. Whereas air conditioner is like a much more expensive purchase. So it's generally quite easy to heat a space. So the first thing I suggest is like just heat your room uh, that you're growing in because you're going to get much faster results. It's also when you don't control the temperature, it's a lot harder to have uh, a good sales model because you, you can't predict when you're going to have product to harvest. So this is why I always recommend people grow microgreens indoors, not in greenhouses, uh, unless you're at like massive scale where, you know, you've had the time to figure out the schedule, the seasonal changes, all that kind of stuff, because it's going to be very, very difficult to be able to sell product that like you expect it to be ready on a Friday, but it's not ready till Sunday because it was colder outside and that cold air is coming inside. So um, I would say like what I would suggest to be the lowest temperature to grow in would be like high 60s. And even that is like a stretch, like low 70s is really like the minimum that I recommend. Mid 70s to, to, to like 80 is ideal, but most people are not going to keep their house at that temperature. But if you have a commercial facility, like 78 is generally 78 to 80 is what you're going to get the fastest growth without having any hindrance on, um, uh, you know, outbreaks of disease or, um, too high, you know, temperature for some seeds to germinate. So that's what I found is the ideal temperature for fastest growth. Um, but fastest growth is determined not just by temperature, but also by, uh, the nutrients in the soil and the light levels. So if you have like ideal temperature of 78, but you have really poor quality lights, your crops are limited by the light. So, uh, using that weakest link model, um, that I've talked about in, in previous podcasts is helpful because, uh, you want to figure out what your weakest link is. So if you're growing in the sixties, I can almost get, or low sixties, especially, I can almost guarantee you your weakest link is your temperature. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would be the first thing I would fix. And then at some point there'll be an, the, the new weakest link and then you improve that. And then eventually you have uh, very few or the weakest links are so minute that they don't have an actual big effect on growth. Uh, and then you have a pretty good system to grow microgreens that will be profitable, fast growing, easy to manage. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just make your life a lot easier. So again, 75 is, is, is a good temperature. 78 to 80 is, is ideal. Minimum would be in my opinion, high sixties, low seventies. Uh, last question for today, have you applied for grants in Canada and is the process pretty straightforward? Um, so in th there's different types of grants, there's like agricultural grants. So where I am in Canada, uh, you have to have $7,000 in provable farm revenue to apply for those type of grants and get a farm business number. And it doesn't matter. You can get a farm business number running under your house. Um, the challenge is that you have to wait until you file your taxes to prove that you have seven thousand dollars in um in taxable uh or, or i guess in revenue i should say uh, so like tax season has just passed so that kind of works for people that have started relatively recently but if you're just starting now and you haven't filed taxes showing that you have farm income uh then you got to kind of you have to unfortunately wait a year um yeah and yes i have applied for for grants in canada um it's called the canadian agricultural partnership is where most of the agricultural grants go through. So there's a few, sometimes there's a few courses you need to take. So if they're like business related ones, there's like a business, a farm business course. If they're like environmental ones, there's an environmental course you have to take. It's just like a day thing. So you just go to, um, uh, a place where there's other farmers. So it's actually a great networking thing to do as well. 
Uh, they may be online now because this was many years ago, but you, you generally need that to be able to apply. So that's step two. So one, step one is get $7,000 of farm revenue and get that on your tax return. The second step is to uh, apply for, depending on which type of grants you wanna go for, uh, to, to do one of those courses. And then uh, the last part is you gotta wait till there's an open window for uh, the grants to be available. So that'll change, um, uh, you know, depending on the government that's in and uh, what they wanna promote in the agricultural world at that time. So uh, it can change. Now in the US, it's there's a lot more grants or even some provinces in Canada, like Quebec, you get way, way more grants. So grants are worth it if the numbers are large enough. So if they can cover like 50% of your lighting, as an example, like if you buy $10,000 worth of lights and you get $5,000, that's like pretty good. It's worth the time. Um, another thing I would consider doing uh, if you are, if time is a limiting factor for you is to apply uh, for grants through a third party that will do the application process for you and take a percentage of what you get. So it doesn't, it generally doesn't cost you anything upfront. It's like, if they think you're a viable candidate, they'll take you on as a client and they'll apply for the grants for you. They'll obviously work with you to, to figure out what makes the most sense. And then you apply for those grants. Um, and the likelihood of you getting those grants is much higher because they're experts in applying for grants. So they would be very good at, uh, wording things correctly and making sure everything is, is, uh, is filled in properly. And then they take, I don't know, 20% or something of what you get in the grant as commission for doing that work. So if I was in a situation, I just honestly probably do that because then you don't have to like spend all the time researching what grants are available. They'll tell you, you tell them what your needs are. Hey, I want to buy a solar mixing machine. Is there any grants available? They'll tell you, they'll go through the process. Yes, you will get less but your time uh, is your most valuable resource in my opinion. So I think that is probably the best way to do it. I remember I used to spend like hours just researching what grants were available because it get very complex uh, in the grant world because there's so, so many of them, it's crazy. Um, and there's so many conditions. And it, honestly, I, that's what I would recommend is just get someone to do it for you and uh, it'll save you a ton of time and you'll still get free money. So um, I think that's well worth it. So hope that answers uh, some of your guys' questions and um, hope that helps you on your journey. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at microgreens consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.